Welcome to the pod bay door. This is the pod bay door. Join the crew every week for conversations on society, politics, and entertainment with a little bit of comedy and a whole lot of Las Vegas thrown in. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. We're glad you joined us. And if you get the chance, subscribe to us and give us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Also, check in with us on our YouTube channel at the Pod Bay Door Podcast. My my dad used to always say he wanted to uh, live long enough to be a burden to his kids and and i tell right. him i says okay you've reached that point right you know now um he always said you know that particularly now with my mom having already died yeah um that you know he doesn't even want oxygen <laughs> okay yeah and and he all you know he talks about it you know he's in the uh, he's in the in the um uh, independent living because he you know he can he no longer drives he gave that up last year but he has a license sure. yeah uh, and he walks his dog twice a day okay so he is independent like that but he's always like, i'm in the old folks home i said well you're an old folk yeah what do you expect exactly you know i'm leaving this place feet first <laughs> yeah yeah i get that idea well what, what else is new pop oh nothing just waiting for the guy to show up with the box <laughs> <laughs> yeah he came for the guy down the hall Oh yeah. my gosh! Because what they do there, what they used to do is, is they have a piano in the lobby right. of, the, of the place. And when somebody right. died, they yes. put their picture on, on the on the, piano. on the piano. So now they have a wall. Oh, so no. that's what they find. He goes, yeah. First thing they do, you wake up in the morning, go downstairs, mm. and check to see if your picture's on the piano. Wow. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, well, it's coming for us all, I guess. Oh yeah. Yeah, the yeah. guy with the robes and the sickle. He's, that's he's right. On the way for all of that's us. That's right. But, uh, well, John, uh, uh, welcome back, uh, Pod Bay Door. Um, we, John and I, uh, as we've said uh, uh, many times, we have um, worked at the Venetian. We've worked in Las Vegas for, for many, many years in different industries. But we worked, uh, I worked six plus years um, within the hospitality industry. Uh, John, you were f- Four years. I was about four. Now four that's years. now yeah. that's actual human years, but, yes. but you have to think of 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 industry years like dog years. I agree. It seemed like it was much longer. Yeah, I felt was, like I was in a Turkish prison camp. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Year one is twelve. Yeah, year two right. is, is ten. Yes, and seven. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I understand. But um, uh, I, I was reading some articles, John, uh, regarding um, the the Asian influence in gambling. Now, last week, of course, we talked about uh, the lucky dragon yeah. uh, going down, yeah. and. Um, uh, I believe I believe she's out for the count. She's like mm. the dragon in uh, in Game of Thrones. It's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. done. Um, but uh, I, I don't know that that reflects a, a negatively on the Asian gambling numbers here in Las Vegas. Uh, uh, but you had mentioned Macau, uh, and I thought that was interesting because Macau was ju- well while John and I were working at the Venetian. Uh, Macau was just a twinkle in Mr. Adelson's eye, yeah. uh, and uh, not even a twinkle uh, in all the rest of the people's eyes. Uh, Krikorian back in the day was still alive, and Steve Wynn was you know, dealing with his properties. Uh, but uh, uh, something you don't know, uh, maybe, I looked at the numbers as of the end of 2016. Macau has 6,287 gaming tables. Mm. Uh, throughout the uh, throughout the, the 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 area, the city, um, and we're responsible for gambling revenues. Not not only just tables, uh, but the machines and the tables. Twenty eight point oh four billion dollars. Now, that being, uh, John and I both knew uh, and both uh, were told that uh, Macau was the next place. In fact, uh, Vegas was supposed to quake in its shoes because. Uh, uh, Macau was going to to take away the Asian gamblers because it's closer, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think you and I at the time disagreed uh, with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think that again we what we what we have a situation like like the King Midas story, mm-hmm. where hey I'm going to kill the I'm going to kill the golden goose. Right. So by building uh, the hotels over there, like Adelson mm-hmm. did, and and like um, Kikorian, I mm-hmm. think did as well, right with right. the MGM. Yeah. Um, by doing that, and yeah, there were a lot of a lot of players, uh, average 
people yes uh, weren't, weren't going to come here. They were going to just go to Macau. So I know that a lot of their uh, their revenues for gambling overall for the whole organization mm-hmm. was coming from Macau. Yes. You know, at least at first. I don't know if the numbers have changed, you know, since then. But by doing that, then they're not coming here. Then our numbers go down. Well, the, the in contrast to the $28.04 billion at the end of 2016, the U.S. numbers across the country, this is not North America, it's just U.S., was $73.1 billion. So, you know, a difference of, uh, what, sh- uh, 50, what is it, 50, no, yes, uh, no, 40, 45 billion yeah. difference. Um, so I, I don't think there, uh, you know, clearly Macau has not been a force. In fact, uh, uh, they've had their first closures um, within the last five years. Um, but uh, uh, I don't, I, I really don't think they've, they've taken away what we expected. Uh, however, I think you hit on something. As you said it, China, Japan, and, and uh, Indonesian countries, uh, I think they have more average gamblers than we thought. Uh, the, the, uh, the dispensable incomes, uh, I think they miscalculated. Uh, or I think they miscalculated the fact that uh, Macau uh, is more interesting than Las Vegas. Um, uh, what do you remember um, as far as the Asian gamblers uh, coming to the Venetian? I remember certain things. What do you remember as far as their habits? You, do you think the whales were still there while we were there? Yeah, a few of them. Um, I remember, of course, we had the the um, the scandal that, that cost Mike French his job. He was the vice president of, of gaming. Yes. Uh, and if you remember, they were having a tournament uh-huh. and they were going to raffle off a brand new car yes. at the end yes. and they had a an asian whale come in mm-hmm. and he had uh maybe lost a million dollars or or he had played a lot yeah it was it was post seven figures easy. yes yeah yeah it was a big number and hey he wins the car yeah <laughs> and it turned out they had rigged it they had yes. rigged it so he would win the car right. and you know uh, it got reported yeah. And and f- they took Mike French out in handcuffs or or escorted out of the building. Right. And of course, it was interesting that a few years later, of course, they didn't have the these hotels in Macau yet. Right. When they did open it up, I I, I just happened to look over there on, online one time and say, "Gee, who is head of the casino for Adelson right. in Macau?" Mike French. Mike French. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you go out one door, you come back in the the other side. Absolutely. You know, it's just it's yeah. yeah. No, I remember that very clearly. Uh, and uh, yeah, that that was a, that was a backbreaker. Yeah. That was a it was a nothing move on the part of the Venetian. Um, uh, and then uh, then it became it, 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 oh gosh, I I say I I remember at least five executives lost their positions. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. They they were just shuffled. Uh, you know, and, and at, at that time, the Sands was its own corporation uh, and uh, was an entity that was beginning to build uh, both Macau and the new towers of the Venetian Palazzo and so on. Uh, and so I think uh, a couple of the execs were shuffled to the Sands, uh, but out of the limelight. Um, now, I spent some quality time in the in the Baccarat room, the Big Bac. Uh, and uh, uh, we've talked about the story where I delivered the, the, the package in the red bag and they lost their minds and, you know, thought the world was coming to an end because, you know, it was bad luck. Um, but uh, uh, I have to say, and, and we've, been, we've been gone from the Venetian, oh, Lord, uh, seven years? I've been, years. I've, been gone, um, I've been gone more than 10. Oh, is it more than 10? For me, yeah. And it's eight for me. Yeah. Um, because you left two years prior to, I, yeah, to me. Yeah. yeah, you suck, by the way. Yeah, so I do. We all you suck for, every for time leaving gonna, you behind. Yeah, I'm going to remind you guys every time. Um, but uh, uh, they it, they were few and far between. The major, major, we've talked about uh, Packard uh, and uh, how, you know, his, his thousands and thousands of dollars of tips. Um, but... Uh, you know the the Baccarat situation for me. I probably was I, I probably was in there, performing my duties as a concierge, delivering or or, or transporting something. Uh, that was also the location of my largest tip, 
uh, I think the the largest single tip I ever received. This isn't this is not combined. It just from one person uh, was it was a uh, it was a thousand dollar plate, uh, and it was out of the baccarat room. And it was from a true whale. I mean, this guy a thousand dollar plate was he probably dropped it and, and it irritated him and he gave it away. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. Um, but that that was my largest single tip. Now now literally. Th- there was the second largest is probably a couple hundred, you know. Uh, we've talked about that, you know. C notes, C notes were easy, you know. Yeah, I got two hundred ones, and that was the most I ever had. Yeah. yeah. Now uh, the strangest one I I remember uh, was a female whale. Whales being giant gamblers, if yeah. you don't know. For a yeah, I, it, most people, yeah. if they if somebody says I'm a high roller, I know they're yeah. full of shit. Yeah, because the industry term is you know if you've been around it is we call them a whale. We call them a whale, uh, and they're and they're very much extinct. But the, we, there was a female whale, and it was probably one of the most awkward situations I had. She had me get twelve one dozen. Bouquets of roses, so twelve. Uh, so one hundred forty-four 144 roses. One hundred forty-four roses in in, in individual. individual yeah. yeah, and um and and wanted me to bring those up by myself as they arrived, and they arrived in two different shipments. And I and when I walked up there for the, with the first shipment, she gave me a hundred dollars. And when I came back, she was then wearing a robe. You know, one of the Venetian robes, yeah. which, I, you know, like an $85 robe. She's wearing one of the robes. And, and I remember robe and slippers. She was wearing the matching <laughs> slippers and and had me place the those roses all around her, her giant uh, jacuzzi tub. She was in one of the, the nicer suites and 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 gave me another hundred. Mm. And there was an awkward moment. And then I left. It was the strangest thing. So can you describe? I mean, how old was she? Oh well, she's Asian, so she's somewhere between fifty and a thousand. Yeah, uh, but I would say she was a solid fifty-five. Okay, I would say you know she was she was not a young not young lady, but uh, I came to find out that she was a a, a a a true whale. I mean, she had money to burn, and her game was uh, strangely was craps. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, not only poker. a woman, but an yeah. Asian woman playing craps. That's so strange. Yeah. But uh, it really was the most awkward thing. I mean, you know, and I've told the story about Van Damme and and all the and and Kenny Rogers. You yeah, talking yeah, about that? Those yeah. were not. This was the weirdest thing, you know. And and she, she I, you know, at first I was gonna, I, I thought to myself, oh man, I'm gonna have to to say thank you, but no, and but no, she she didn't say a word. Didn't say a word. So two hundred dollars, one hundred and forty four roses later, I left, and she did what she did. I don't know. Strange. Strange. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> now uh, American sports bet, uh, 7% of the population that comes here uh, places a sports bet. So the entire population. Yeah. So all of the visitors annually, 7% place a sports bet. And I found that to be very interesting. Now, do you do you, do you bet sports? I personally don't, um, but I've had friends like Super Bowl. They'll yeah. say, "Hey, I'll send you a hundred bucks. We put, we go to, you know, place a bet for me." And I've done that. Right. And then it's like, okay, I, I'll place it. I'll send you the money if you win. They never win. Sure. So, uh, you know, I still, th- I, I may still have the tickets at home. Right. From a couple of Super yeah. Bowls ago, but yeah, I, I've done that. But I look at it and thought, you know, I, these guys are really good. Yeah. When they, you know, I look, I said, Jesus, it, it was a two and a half point spread on that, mm-hmm. and it was a three point game. So, aha, uh-huh, they win. It's just like they're really good at that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, here's another interesting one that I that I, I found along with all this, all the data I found with the Las, uh, LVCC, the Las Vegas uh, Convention Center, has these wonderful stats uh, that I draw from. Uh, 25% of the population that visits Las Vegas spends $100 technically zero to $100. Okay. Yeah, and so 25%. That's I, I find that to be very high. Yeah, don't yeah. you? Yeah. I mean, if you consider now, just on gambling, you know, they've already spent their money on lodging and transpo, um, uh, and uh, uh, discretionary funds and things of like that. But just gambling, they have reserved reserved one to one hundred dollars. But twenty five percent of the total population. That's I, I find that amazing. 
Well, I know for, for when we're looking at like like the Asian gamblers, um, yeah. for the Japanese, you know, when I dealt with them because you know I was the, the Japanese speaker at the, yes. at the desk. How's your Japanese nowadays? It's still not bad. I mean, it's not great anymore. I mean, I've lost mm-hmm. lost touch with it, but um, yeah, I can still get by. I could yeah. go there. Um, you know, I, I had a layover in Japan on a flight to China, oh maybe ten years ago. Yeah. And uh, and I was fine. Yeah. I could I I you know I got along fine. We used to say John uh, Ichiban desu ka ne? <laughs> and he was John was number one. <laughs> well, and you know most of the the Japanese are unlike maybe some of the other uh, uh, Asians like like the, like the Chinese are not big gamblers. No. Um, most of the Japanese that I dealt with were hotel guests. Now they, which isn't to say they're not one of those twenty-five percent, because those almost certainly are. Yes. They're going to drop ten bucks in the slot machine, yeah. and that's it. They're not going to play a table game. They have to speak English. They don't want to do that. Right. At all costs, um, they don't want to have to talk to anybody. Yes. And uh, so, so slot machines back then, even then, you know, you had a coins or, mm-hmm. or tokens mm-hmm. or something like that you could yeah. put in there. I miss those days. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I do too. And. Um, uh, you know, so so they could they could do that and they could play and, you know, so so most of the most of the Japanese that I deal with were, were hotel were hotel guests. They had hotel questions. Sure. They wanted to play golf. Sure. They wanted to go on a tour. They wanted to see a show. Yeah. But gaming, I think there was one or possibly two Japanese guests that I dealt with yeah. that were casino guests. And they weren't real they weren't real whales. They were, you know, they were yeah. f- fair, but you know, I think you're right. I, I, I think the percentage eighteen uh, percent, by the way, of, of the gamblers to Vegas Gamblers now, not not just you know visitors. Gamblers are Asian. I, f- that, I found that to be an interesting. Yeah, because well. when I lived in Japan, there were a lot of travel shows about Las Vegas, mm-hmm. so it absolutely appeals. And Japanese yeah. love hotels. Yeah, uh, even in, in Tokyo, it's a big deal. Let's go to a restaurant. Let's go to the one in the hotel. Right. Well, why not? There's another one right down the street that's that's even better. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter. It's not in a hotel. Right. They like to go there. Like to look around. And oh, is it kid is and it pretty? They look mm-hmm. at the flowers. So they're I say, oh God, they're gonna love Las Vegas for sure. that. They're coming here to look at the hotels. Yeah. Now, now uh, on the other, uh, well, the, the, when they referred to Asian gamblers, I looked at the the sort of the demographics of it, um, uh, including Guam, which I thought that was an interesting because it's really not Asia, but yeah. Um, uh, they uh, uh, Chinese, of course, were were the the, the largest percentage, uh, followed quickly by um, uh, Japanese. Philip, the Philippine uh, contingent is a tough one because a lot of those, a lot of those travelers stay. You know, uh, you know, the, the John spent some you know, quality time in the Philippines, and they come here yeah. and they stay, which is why you know you've told me you know laws have changed in the Philippines because they're leaving and not yeah. coming back. Yeah, but um, but also in the Philippines, in Manila, they have they have legalized gambling. They have yes. a, like a they have a block. Of a couple of hotels, I've been there, right. and of course it's like in their casinos. I mean, I'm not, you know, I, uh, last thing I'm going to be impressed with is a casino, but but it's there. Right. Um, I think culturally, you know, there there are instances of of third world gambling. I would call it yeah. cockfighting. Yeah, that's big in Southeast Asia, particularly you know the Philippines. I, right. you know, when I'm out in the countryside there, I would hear roosters. Now I always thought I'm a city guy. I don't know a lot about roosters, but mm-hmm. I always know, well, the rooster crows in the morning when the right. sun comes up. Right. Not in the Philippines, three o'clock in the morning. Fucking rooster. <laughs> Wherever I go, and I'm the only guy who hears it. Right. Filipinos, do you hear that rooster? No, because they're used to it. Oh my gosh. And I asked them, I said, why is it the roosters at three in the morning, two in the morning? Doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Every place I go, there's a fucking rooster. And why do people have roosters and not hens? Hens, I can understand. You know, they, you get eggs from them, but uh-huh. a rooster's pretty useless. Yeah. And they said, cockfighting. And that's it. They're 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 aggressive, yeah. and they're and they're letting you know that they're awake. Right. And and you know. Uh, yeah. Huh. Fuck the world. That's right. That's right. Fuck the world. Uh, <laughs> <You know? laughs> I've had I've had similar issues with peacocks. They've driven me out of my mind here in in Las Vegas. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm sure Vegas would you know somehow in, in if our current trend wasn't. Um, the uh, the well, I guess it would be hashtag Rooster Two. Yeah, uh, you know, the, if it wasn't like that, I'm sure Vegas would consider cockfighting to go along with the, all the marijuana. But uh, um, now I've dealt with most of my whales. Actually, strangely, with the, 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 that you say that we're we're not Japanese. In fact, I, I don't. Just that one woman. Uh, all the rest were were um, 
Chinese. Now, there was a big scandal that I read about in the Japanese newspapers uh, before I moved here. Mm -hmm. um, and the gamblers that were here, the, the, the whales, the Japanese whales that were coming here, right. tended to be Yakuza, tended to be of the, from the underground. Yeah. And the scandal was there was one uh, Yakuza uh, whale was at the MGM. Mm -hmm. He was basically using it to launder money. Mm -hmm. sure. And then all of a sudden he found his name at the top of the list for, for a liver transplant. Mm. Um, Yakuza in particular have a high incidence of liver cancer or problems with liver. It's, uh, they, they drink a lot. Oh, sure. So you have that. And I'd heard that it's because, that they, they, because they're the ones in Japan that have the full body tattoos. Yeah. That somehow this prevented the sweat glands uh, from from working, you uh -huh, know, from uh -huh. from, uh, from doing the normal function. So a lot of the toxins that we sweat out of our body gets mm. reabsorbed by them and has to go back through the liver. Wow. I, I talked to a dermatologist about that because yeah. I'd asked him about tattoos because you know I've got a son, seventeen, he wants to get a tattoo. Oh, does he? So I thought, yeah, he wants to get a tattoo. He said, well, when you're eighteen, you know, I'll get to, but get a goddamn good one because right. you're gonna be stuck with it for a long time. Yeah. Um, so I asked a dermatologist about that. I said, is it, he said, there's nothing wrong with it. He said, no, he said, you know, the, the, you, it's possible someone get an infection yeah. when they first get it done, but it doesn't have any long lasting. I think it's the, the first one. I think it's probably uh, cirrhosis related, you know, but yeah. uh, that's yeah. an interesting story. I've never yeah. heard that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that was out of the MGM. Oh, yeah. And one of the Japanese guys that I did deal with in there, I looked him over because Yakuza have a distinctive way of appearance. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I wonder if this guy, I'm not going to ask him what he does. Yeah. But yeah, he he very well could have been Yakuza. Oh, I know for a fact both you and I, uh, you know, uh, interacted, if not helped, uh, many different you know, communities of, of organized crime. Yeah. I have oh, no sure, doubt, sure. no doubt whatsoever. Um, you know, from Yakuza all the way, you know, to the to the out of the mob out of New York or Chicago for that matter. Now, now I, I saw a really interesting article. And it brought up the possibility that Las Vegas, t to, to today, con on a contemporary level, caters to and unfairly markets subliminally to Asians. And they, sp they mentioned specifically uh, gaming, uh, the, uh, the electronic gaming uh, machine graphics. There's dragons and Buddhas and Shinto uh, symbols, and do you, th do you find a any validity to that whatsoever? Well... Or do you think it's the other way around? Do you think they're, uh, the Occidental community, they're, they're trying to, you know, because we find it neat, we, we suck up all the, you know, all the other communities, you know, uh, culture. What do you think? It's probably a little bit of both, because, yeah. you know, one of the things that Japan has exported in more recent years, and when I went, went over, when I was first over there in the 80s, our biggest export to Japan was culture. Mm -hmm. So you saw, you know, you know the, the, the bad sides of it, the McDonald's everywhere, and everybody's right. eating that shit. Um, some of the TV shows, uh, I remember turning on TV, there was, uh, what was it, Jessica Obasan no Tanjo, the Journal of Aunt Jessica's Accidents, or what we called Murder, She Wrote. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was a tr translation, right. if I remember that. All and right. then even older than that, but everybody knew it was Oksan Nomajo, literally the uh, the the uh, the magical housewife, bewitched. Bewitched. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was big, and all the movies go over there. But what yeah. a lot of people don't know is, is that the stars, big stars, uh -huh. at the height of their career, will make a TV commercial in Japan. So oh, you yeah. see S Sylvester Stallone yeah. over there hawking hams. <laughs> and Brad Pitt and uh, right. Leonardo DiCaprio, all of them did car commercials and they didn't want them to be seen here. Because remember, these are the days before YouTube and sure. before the Internet. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you would see, yes, oh, Jesus Christ, here's Arnold Schwarzenegger selling a, a soft drink. Yeah. You know? now, now, I know it's been a while since you've, since you've been exposed to their community. Um, uh, uh, and you have family members that are there right now. Yeah. Uh, and, and your boy, of course, uh, you know, has, has that lineage. What is, what's the typical Japanese male like and why would he come to Las Vegas? I think it's, to me, it's more of an appeal to the women. Um, okay. most of the Japanese guys that I knew when I, when I first went over there and was teaching and, you know, I, I had to cut my teeth on business classes. These guys were dry. They were dull, yeah. I thought, and uh, not much life to them. The women had some, some besides being nice to look at, Yeah, um, they had some personality. Uh -huh. They smiled now and then. They laughed. 
the guys often didn't. They were just dour. They were dark. Over time, I got to understand <laughs> why, you know, just because of the of just the way their their lives are are designed. But I do see more of it as women have a lot of power in Japan. People don't really realize. You think it's 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 very sexist, and it is. Mm-hmm. But traditionally, the Japanese woman controlled the finances in the household. So the guy made the check. And in the old days, when I first went there in 1984, you didn't have automatic deposit. They paid you once a month. Everybody gets paid in Japan once a month, not twice a month like mm-hmm. it was here. The 31st or the 30th of the month, you got an envelope full of cash. So I, re- I remember thinking, wow, this must be a this must be a great place to roll people because every you know everybody got paid. Everybody's loaded today yeah. with cash. Yeah. And I remember talking to another foreign guy. He said the exact same thing. He goes, hey, this is a great day to go roll somebody around. That's funny. And it's funny how we think like that. Like, my God, I wouldn't want to carry all this money around with me. And do you think that, that discretionary cash is, is, I mean, what, what makes them get on the plane? Because that's a, that's, a, that's a rough flight. Yeah. We were talking about it during the pre-show. That's a long flight. Yeah. What, I mean, do they, well, I know that the, the compared to the, the standard American male, Japanese make more. I mean, the standard of living is higher, so yeah. they make more. But do they make so much more that they can come over here in droves like they do? Well, what the Japanese have been very good at, um, generally speaking, is saving money. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, it was that the guy got the money, end of the month. And there's the wife right on the doorstep with mm-hmm. her hand out. Mm-hmm. Give it to me. She counts it all out and she gives him his allowance. Hmm. Usually it might be 20,000 yen, a couple hundred bucks. That's it. So I could hear these guys on the train mm-hmm. bitching and moaning, hey, my wife won't give me any more money. Uh, I can't even buy a book to read. Uh, <laughs> you know, they'd be whining on there. Yeah. But then the companies twice a year would usually give them a bonus. Okay. And, you know, the, 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 their salary was enough to pay all their bills for the month. Right. And maybe a little bit left over, but not much. Right. If they needed to get a new washing machine or something like that, mm-hmm. that's when the bonus came in. Okay. And they would get, you know, five to $10,000 twice a year okay. extra on that bonus. That's what they would use on their vacations, which are unnecessary, which are, which by our standards are really short, usually maybe a week. They usually go during certain times of year, like May. They have what they call Golden Week. It's like extended four-day weekend. Okay. And I've known people to go to San Francisco from Tokyo on a four-day weekend. I thought, I wouldn't bother. Mm-hmm. Y- you lose a day in travel, yeah. and then you're, you're, you lose a second day just recovering. Sure. But no, that because that's that's all they have. So. Do, you, do you think they're getting away from the, especially with... with with uh, how connected we are across the globe, do you think they're getting away from their homogeneous society, or are, are they? Is that just Japan? I mean, is that is 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 everyone connected to everyone, and and uh, you know everything is the same? You know, individuality. They, they still is, are. They, they, they are. They are because a couple of years ago there was a, the it was a it was a big deal in Japan. Mm-hmm. The woman who won Miss Japan was a 19 year old girl who was uh, her mother was Japanese father mm-hmm. was it was a uh, african-american serviceman mm-hmm. well she did not look Japanese she was a gorgeous girl she was six feet tall yeah. and and really beautiful um, but she didn't look Japanese and the Japanese were we can't have her as miss Japan yeah she doesn't look Japanese and the fact that she was only what they call Japanese term for being of mixed race is half at which I always irritated me why are you only half and not double Right, he was. Well, you know, it's it's half of this and half. Well, right. you mean they're they're what? They're half human? No, 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 no. half Japanese. Well, why don't you say that? If you want to use a term, why don't you say double? Because they're yeah. they're two cultures, not you know they're bi they're biracial. Yes. Um, but anyhow, I remember thinking that that was interesting. That they didn't, you know, they they did not get behind this girl because mm-hmm. of the fact that, and she had said herself that she was bullied in school and called names, yeah. which was typical, which is one reason why, you know, when I had my son, one get out of there, I don't want to be there mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. he gets older. He doesn't really look, when he goes over there, they don't think he's Japanese because he really doesn't look it. Okay. You know, he doesn't really. Well, you know, I, I spend more time in in, uh, in the hotels and casinos now for what I do uh, than you do, I, I think. Um, uh, you're just there as, as you know, on a, on a consumer level. I'm, yeah. You know, I'm there working so I can observe things. Um, I have to say that I don't see a reduction in the number, uh, you know, if I look at a group of 100 people uh, as, as I did, you know, eight years ago, 
I don't perceive a reduction in the number of Asian uh, uh, members of, uh, of that community uh, at all. But based on the numbers I'm reading, they're, they're not spending as much. No one is, and which is why, obviously, the Lucky Dragon. I don't know if the Lucky Dragon was, was aiming itself towards Asian clientele directly or not. They really haven't said uh, in any of their marketing materials, but uh, uh, it looks as if they were, and it was it was a giant failure. Um, I I don't know. I don't know if it's a, as big an influence as possible. Now, is the, is there any gambling in Japan? No, no. It was interesting. About about four years ago, mm-hmm. I was contacted by somebody at the well, um, one of the HR people at MGM. Mm-hmm. They were thinking of of doing their own in house. ESL program for their for their employees, okay. mostly the housekeepers. Okay, you know ESL being English as a second language. Right. They 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 come here. Their English is limited. Mm-hmm. Uh, they work in the hotels as housekeepers, as porters, as whatever. Right. And they were they had contracted this out, but they thought because they were so big, they had so many properties, it might be worth it to them to consider doing it on their own. Mm-hmm. So they they wanted to pick my brain about that because I had the the ESL background, I also had the hotel background. So I went and I, and I was and I and I met with with one of the one of the people there, and he had mentioned to me that they were that MGM was just licking their chops, waiting for Japan to because Japan does not allow gambling. And what they do have is pachinko, um, pachinko being like a slot machine sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But they get around the gambling thing because you you trade. What happens is you you get a rack of balls, right. and then you know you get a bucket of balls, and then at the end you cash in what balls you have left. And if you have more than what you started from, there's an excess. Right. But instead of giving you cash, they give you cigarettes or they give you some type of a, you know, chocolate covered almonds. So they get around the gambling because that's, that's a big deal. They also have horse racing. They yes. do have some cities have what they call the cable Joe, the horse racing. I used to live in a town that had to get and our tax rates were lower because they because of the, the horse racing. Yeah. But flat out casinos, no. But they were thinking, Japan was thinking of changing that rule because of the Olympics. They needed to fund, come up with, generate money to fund a, the bid for the Olympics. And they thought if they allowed gambling in, um, in Tokyo, like, like they allow gambling in Manila, that this would be something that would generate income and the right. MGM was going to be all over it. They wanted to get a license. They were going to build a <laughs> hotel. And I thought, great, they're going to take away more business from here because yeah. now people who do gamble, Hey, I would do it. Why go all the way to Las Vegas when I could just, if that's what I want to do. Right. Um, but you know, again, the Japanese, I did not think when I was there were really gung ho on gambling. Mm-hmm. Like I said, you had some guys that went to the racetrack. They tended to be lower class. I mean, you could use, tell them when they got on the train, Oh, that guy's going to the cable Joe. He's going to the racetrack and just look at him and he smells, you know, of, of sake and, and he hasn't shaved in three days. And, okay. and those were the types who went to respectable people didn't go to the, to the horse race. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Well, it'll be interesting to see in 2018, you know, what the numbers say. Um, or actually, I'd like, you know, I'm, uh, as soon as I can get them, I'll get the numbers for 2017. Because 2017, it seems to be accepted globally, was a crappy year for everybody. Yeah. Uh, but, and, you know, uh, the other thing is, depending on the country's the exchange rate. Yes. If the exchange rate is is you know works one way or the other, if the dollar is strong, mm-hmm. then that means that they get less to spend. Yeah. So that's another that's something that really you know the city itself or the industry really doesn't have a control over. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, John, I'm going to hit you with uh, 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 what's trending. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna, I, I, I I'm going to pick out one trending item and see what your thoughts are. Uh, and then we'll say goodbye for this week. Um, uh, I saw, I read an article uh, this morning um, and regarding the AI assistants, um, Echo, Google, uh, Siri, so on and so forth. And uh, it was posited that uh, it is inevitable that every person will will have to have this type of, of uh, AI assistant regardless of you know their station in life to run the things that they run like televisions telephones uh air conditioners and so on and so forth that we are very close you know within a decade of everyone having to have one to run something necessary in their home do you agree well you know i have one of those devices i guess i have the I, google yes, I do too. And, yeah. and you know it's 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 interesting i like playing with it yeah 
uh, in the sense I'll ask it something and sometimes it'll say, I don't know what you want. And I realize, okay, because <laughs> right. I look at it linguistically, how can I phrase it? And yeah. I have to sit there and I think about it. And then I phrase it when I get, and I get the answer that I want. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's been, a com I've asked it complicated questions. How many days have passed between now and August 6, 2011? Mm -hmm. And it'll tell me, mm -hmm. but I have to phrase it in the right way that it can, that it can parse it. Right. So I, I, I realize that, you know, for, and I know I've seen this on, there was something posted on YouTube a couple of weeks ago where somebody gave one of these, one of the, the, uh, the Google home to, to their old grandmother and she's trying to get it to work. And I, old people in technology don't are a bad mix. Yeah. And part of the reason is, you know, your language skills uh, over over time as you age, mm -hmm. they deteriorate. Yes. And human speech is full of uh, we call disfluencies, right? We have false starts, uh, things like that. Oh, and, I'm guilty of that now. You know, we don't <laughs> speak in quote unquote grammatically correct sentences i mean yeah. i see this in standards and it just irritates me because a sentence is a written convention i agree you know we speak in in what we call an idea unit we speak for meaning so if you actually transcribe human speech you, you mm -hmm. see that there's a lot of grammatical errors and things like that oh, yeah. that that we allow and and a lot of that is evolutionary because um while you and i talk if i if i pause i have to think about what i'm going to say i i restart i rephrase something yes uh, it gives you time to process those sounds and, and derive meaning from what I said. So there has to be this. These devices aren't built to do that. They're built to understand, quote unquote, grammatically correct structured sentences. Right. So with older people who are going to, uh, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. You, you know, yeah, it, it's not going to be able to be of much help to them. So, no, yeah, no, and I look at a lot of the things that it can do for me. Yes. What's what's the weather like? I can look it up. I can do it. You can look out the window. I, I can look out the window. <laughs> I want to know what the weather is in L.A. today because we're going to go to Universal Studios or yes. whatever. Yes. I can look it up, but it's just as easy to ask the assistant to do it. That's true. So is it a replacement or do we do I have to have it or is it just something nice to have? Well, right now it's nice to have, yeah. but this this uh, author was saying that it's inevitable that we're going to have them like we do. Well, like TVs became you know a household you know have to have. Uh, I can't imagine an individual not having a TV of some sort. But he's saying that's where it's going to go. But I agree with you, especially um, if the, uh, the the speech recognition doesn't take into effect those pauses are huge. I mean, I I, I absolutely agree with you because uh, it'll reset. It'll it'll turn right off uh, because I you know and I and I'll I'll um I, I don't know what what happens to the brain when you do it, but uh, you, I think you're trying to accommodate the 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 assistant, speak properly, and between the two there's a delay and everything shuts off and you're just irritated. You're across yeah. the room and and it's it, it's just and it's it's really funny to me. I also tried something. The other day, and uh, thankfully, uh, my echo didn't recognize it. Uh, and something you might find interesting uh, to to speak improperly. I said I asked her. I said uh, you know, I won't use her name because we're sitting actually right next to one of them. Uh, I said, "Where you be at?" And she didn't answer. And I tried it again, and I said um, uh, uh, something like, "Who dat?" You know, uh, you know, I said, I said, uh, Samuel Jackson, who dat? And she didn't get it. So, so I hopefully they'll stay away from adjusting uh, for you know the urbanization of language, uh, like the the dictionary has. I mean, we have thing, we have phrases, truncated phrases from Homer Simpson now in the dictionary. It's, it's painful. It's painful for John, yeah, <laughs> yeah. especially for John. I can imagine. You're well, just, you know, I worked years ago. Well, I worked on a project in China when I was at McGraw-Hill Education. Right. And what they wanted was speech recognition on a speaking test for yeah. ESL kids. I thought, no, because all of this is usually done one-on-one uh, -on -one with, with an administrator and listening, it needs to be a human. And, and uh, the kid would say something, a response to something, and then they have to evaluate the student's response. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, no, we can, we can use this with speech recognition. It'll be great because then, the, you know, all the students can do it at the same time. And right. yeah, it, it would be great if it worked. Um, but I remember there was one question and it was invite your friend to lunch. So they wanted to see w whether or not the, the, the kid could put together a, 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 a request like that. Right. And what he said was, 
let's go eat the dumpling. Remember, this is in China. This was a Chinese kid. Let's go eat the dumpling. And the machine, I said, you know, we cannot possibly, I can try to constrain these. Because what they wanted was basically a lexicon, a, you know, a, a, a glossary of all the possible responses that would be correct. All right. Hey, let's go get something. You want to go to lunch? You know, uh, let's grab let's grab a bite. But you know, some of this is going to be cultural. And let's go get the dumpling. Is it is to me? I said that functions as a request. I understand mm. what it, it's unusual. Mm. Um, it's a little bit awkward. A native speaker might not say that, but nevertheless, it is a successful speech act mm -hmm. because he is able to make that. But the machine would just say it's wrong because it's not in part of its. Mm. It's you know, it's basically its vocabulary. So. Well, John, I, I think Skynet's coming from us. I, we're not going to see it, but uh, Arnold and the, and the machines, they're, they're, they're coming. They're coming. Yeah, they're coming. Yeah, just... um, but uh, I wanted to mention a couple of things as we say goodbye to everybody. Um, see, I'm doing it right there. I, I'm, I'm terrible. What's that called again? What? Disfluency? Uh, disfluency. I am a disfluent speaker of uh, uh, the top of the pile. Uh, uh, we had an email from, uh, we've gotten several, uh, quite a few emails actually from Afghanistan. And, uh, my assumption was it was from our military personnel and, uh, um, uh, at least one of them was, and, uh, his name Joshua. And I wanted to uh, recognize uh, him and say thank you for your email. Uh, he and the guys out there say they listen to us uh, during their day. And uh, I cannot think of a cooler thing uh, than that. So hello to everybody out there. We appreciate everything you're doing. And uh, keep listening. And uh, we appreciate uh, uh, all the listenership. Speaking of that... Uh, as we approach our one year for the Pod Bay Door, John, uh, which is uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day, uh, we are most likely now, if, if something drastic doesn't happen, going to surpass our 25,000 downloads. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, it's no Joe Rogan, but we're doing pretty well. Uh, but uh, I want to thank everybody who listens, everybody who downloads, and all the comments and suggestions. Um, uh, John and I will keep going with all of that. Hopefully, we um, uh, a little bit shorter format. We can uh, get uh, m more of you involved. So uh, let us know how we're doing, and uh, we will see you next week. John, thank you again very much. Great time. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks to everyone listening and watching. You can catch the Pod Bay Door on the Podbean app or any of your favorite podcast apps, including iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and Stitcher Radio. You can watch the show on our YouTube channel at the Pod Bay Door Podcast. Please download, like, and subscribe. Our social connectivity screen is coming up. Check in with us on Facebook, Twitter, and WordPress. The Pod Bay Door is closed and talent is out. Hey everybody, thank you very much for tuning into the show. We would love to hear your show suggestions and comments. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, please click to subscribe. You can also connect with us on Facebook using at PBD Podcast, on Twitter using at TPBD Podcast, and on WordPress at thepodbaydoor.wordpress.com.